Have you ever met someone yes. to whom you, not done yet, <laughs> have you ever met someone to whom you quoted the Bible and they said, oh, that thing was written by men, contains errors and contradictions, and you can't live by it nowadays? Okay, so how many of you, I want you to show your hands, how many of you have ever, you've thought that yourself or you've heard somebody say it, either one, you've thought in your mind, this thing has errors in it and you can't live by it, or someone has said it to you, raise your hand now. All right, so most of us. All right, second question, same, same format. Have you or someone you know ever said, I can't understand scripture on my own, okay? When the preacher preaches it, it makes sense, but when I go home and read it by myself, I don't understand it. Raise your hand. If you or someone you know has ever said that, all right? Again, most of us. Okay, third question. Have you ever met someone who said that they understood the Bible and they believed the Bible? but then they didn't live by it. And you thought it was sort of weird that they would claim to understand it and believe it and then not live as if it were true. Can I see your hands? Okay, so almost every single person here. So yes, all of these are very common situations. I have met people in all of these categories that I just described for you. And in some ways I'd say I've kind of been the person in all of those categories at some point in my life. Um, and so I'm hoping that this sermon will be helpful to all of us in all of those categories. If you are someone who has said it, if you are someone who knows someone who has said it, basically, if you raised your hand at any point so far in this sermon, this sermon is for you. Now, if you were here last week, you probably remember me saying that this week's sermon would basically be the second half of last week's sermon. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was kind of unusual, right? What did we do last week that we don't usually do? Yeah, we voted. Why did we do that? That was crazy. So what happened last week, if you weren't here, is we, I had a 40-minute sermon prepared, but we had Lord's Supper to celebrate, and it seemed like it was a lot to fit in all in one Sunday, so we took a vote as to whether we're going to do the whole sermon or whether we'll just do the first half and save the next half for this week. And so the 20-minuters um, won and we, the, the vote, and so I just preached half the sermon last week, and this week I told you I would give you the second half. So today I'm going to finish up what we started talking about last week. However, in order to do that... We need to get back into the frame of mind that we were in last week at the end of the sermon, right? Like, I can't just start this sermon with an in conclusion, right? Like, I can't just literally pick up where I left off. I, we need to get back to what we were thinking. And so, um, the series is Life of Paul, series two. This is the second part of his life. We're talking about the missionary journeys that he took, this character in the New Testament. Um, there's a map that's going to come up. This is a map that shows where we are so far in his second missionary journey. He traveled over here to Philippi a few weeks ago. I think we spent like a couple of weeks talking about the Philippians and his time that was in Philippi. Then he traveled to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was the town and the story that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And then last week, we talked about Berea. Okay, what happened um, when Paul went to Berea? And so we did, I, like in the sermon, we talked about the verses that say what happened there, and then we just sort of cut it off before we got to the, a lot of the application and the what it has to do with us part of the sermon. So we started last week with Berea, and so that's where we're picking up. We're still in Berea. We're talking about what happened when Paul was there. So if you have your Bible with you, you can turn to Acts chapter 17. I'm going to read to you verses 10 through 15. It's just six verses, and it's the same six verses from last week. Okay, last week's text is this week's text. Here we are, Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 10. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas off to Berea. On arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. The people here were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, since they welcomed the message with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Consequently, many of them believed, including a number of the prominent Greek women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica found out that God's message had been proclaimed by Paul at Berea, they came there too, agitating and disturbing the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul away to go to the sea, but Silas and Timothy stayed on there. Those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving instructions for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, they departed. So you remember it? 
That was our story from last week, that, that where we had picked up from was that he was in Thessalonica and he ran away basically in the middle of the night and he, and he escaped to Berea. And when he got to Berea, he did the same thing that he had done in Thessalonica. He preached the gospel to the people that were there. And there were people who converted, people who started to believe in Jesus Christ because of his message. And then eventually there was a crowd of people that was stirred up and kicked him out of town. The same thing that had happened in Thessalonica, except in this case, it was the Thessalonians who traveled to Berea and got the people angry at Paul so that he, they would push him off to the next town that he escaped to. And so that was the story. And in the midst of that story, there's a section where it talks about that the people that were there in Berea, they, they handled the gospel message better than the people in the town before. And we talked about last week how, do you remember how we said they were open-minded, but they weren't too open-minded, right? It was this, like, this perfect balance that the Bereans were open-minded. The passage says they were open-minded. The passage says that they received the word or they welcomed the message, but they weren't too open-minded. It, doesn't, it does not say that they welcomed the message because they welcomed every message that came along. No, it says that they checked the scriptures to see if these things were so. And so that's where we left off last week. So now with all of that in our mind, let's go ahead and, and move on to this week's sermon. This morning, what I'd like to do is I'd like to point out three things that we can learn from verse 11. And this is what I would have said last week. At least a lot of this I would have said. Okay, three things that we can learn from verse 11. So this is verse 11. The people here, meaning the people in Berea, the people here were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. They accepted the message better. Since they welcomed the message with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. I think that there are three things that we can learn from this verse that are implied. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about three um, implications that are in this text. For those of you who have attended church here for quite a while, you already know that I do this. Um, but for those of you that haven't, I guess I should let you know. There are times when in preaching the Word of God and trying to understand the Bible, I will just look at what the Bible directly says and then say that to you, right? Like, it's just like, this is what it says, and then I re-say to you what the Bible says. We just go with what the Bible directly says. But there are other times where I like to look at Bible passages and ask the question, what is implied here? Right? What, there are certain passages in the Bible that when you read them, you realize there are certain truths that the passage does not directly say but you can tell that the writer of the passage assumed it to be true, or the sentence that he did write wouldn't make sense. Are you following me? That sometimes you read things and you go, well, he didn't say this, but the thing he did say shows that he just assumed that that was true. And so I think that there are three things about the Word of God, or three things about Scripture, that this verse doesn't directly say, but you can just tell when the writer wrote it, and when the people were doing these things, this was just assumed to be true. So three things that are implied in this text is that the Word of God is true, understandable, and to be accepted. Those are the three things I wanted to teach you this morning. The Word of God, the sacred scriptures are true, understandable, and to be accepted. Now, technically, this verse doesn't say that, right? But I want to show you how it says that, okay? How it implies that. So the Word of God is true, understandable, and to be accepted. Let's start with true. Why would I say this verse teaches that the, the scriptures are true? And this is why, because they welcome the message with eagerness and they examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were, what's the word? So, that's the word right there. The, the reason I'm telling you that the scriptures are true and that that is assumed in this verse is because of that word right there, so. They examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Another way that you could paraphrase that is they, they check the Bible to see if these things were true. That when Paul and Silas came to town and gave them this new message of God, they said, hey, we got to check on this. And the passage doesn't say that they checked the newspaper to see if it's true, right? They checked the scriptures to see if it was true. So you can tell what is assumed is before Paul and Silas showed up, they already believed the scriptures were true. They believed that the Old Testament scriptures were the word of God. So when Pilate, Paul, and, Paul and Silas show up and give them this new message, they compare what they're now hearing to what? to this thing that they already think is true. And they're thinking, well, does it match the thing we already believe? Does it match the thing we already think is true? That's what's happening here. They were examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The assumption is we already know a true thing. Now, does it match with this thing they're saying? Because they're saying the Messiah had to suffer and rise again. Does that match with the thing we already assume is true? So the scriptures are true. That's an assumption. Here's the second thing. The scriptures are understandable. Well, how do you know that the scriptures are understandable? I get that from... They welcome the message with eagerness and examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So when someone came with a new message and they wanted to match and see, or they wanted to check and see if it matched with the old message, 
they thought that they could do that by doing what? By reading it. They, they looked at their Old Testaments and they said, well, let's just examine it and let's just see if it matches what, what, we, what has already been revealed to us by God. They assumed the scriptures were understandable. When Paul and Silas showed up, they didn't go, oh, we need to see if this matches the Old Testament. And someone else didn't go, well, well, how could we possibly know what the Old Testament means? Yeah, good point. Goodness gracious. We could never understand that on our own. We need to pray that an angel comes down and gives us special spectacles or some sort of miraculous thing so that we could understand this thing that ordinarily could never be understood in order to see if it matches. That's not what they did at all. Paul and Silas showed up and said, let me tell you things about the Messiah. And they went, oh, okay, well, let's just check. Let's just read it and see if it matches with what he's saying. The assumption was the Old Testament scriptures are, are understandable. They could just be read and you can see if it matches what the new message is. And then the third thing that's implied in this passage is that the scriptures are to be accepted. The word of God, the message of God is to be accepted by the person that's hearing it. If it's true, right, and it's understandable, then it is supposed to come into their life and change them. It is to be accepted or received into your life. Where do I get that idea from? Well, I'll start with this word right here. They were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. That's clearly a compliment, right? He's saying they did good because they, what's the word? Welcome. They welcomed the message with eagerness. The word welcomed means they accepted it. They received it into their life. Okay? So you've kind of got two messages here. You've got the message that's coming to them that's the new one, right? The one that's from Paul and Silas, and they welcomed that message. And one of the reasons they welcomed it is because they checked to see if it matched what? A previous message they'd already had that they had already welcomed into their life. Do you see that that's assumed there? The scriptures, the reason they checked the scriptures rather than something else is because they had already received, they had already re accepted the Old Testament as the word of God, right? That is something that they had already, they had already changed their life, right? That's why they were in a synagogue, right? Because they were believing in the Old Testament. Their life had already been changed. They had already accepted it into their life as something that they're going to live by. And then a new message comes along, and they welcomed that. They accepted that and changed their life. That's why it says they converted. That's why it says many of them believed. Like they came to know and, and, and changed who they were living for and the way that they were living their life. And so you sort, sort of have two messages in here that were accepted by them, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, we don't think of it as the New Testament. You go, well, the New Testament's not in there. It, it is. See, a lot of us and this isn't wrong, but a lot of us think that the new, when we think of the New Testament, we think of the section of the Bible from Matthew to Revelation. And we go, that's the New Testament, which is, that's correct. But there's a sense in which the New Testament existed before Matthew wrote Matthew and before Mark wrote Mark. Like, so there's the, the Old Testament, which also could be called the Old Covenant, and the New Testament or, or New Covenant. You've probably heard that before, right? That those are interchangeable. There was an Old Covenant and there's a New Covenant. The new covenant, the new message about Jesus and that he's like died on the cross for our sins and we can believe in him and he rose again, like that new covenant existed even before people wrote it down. When Jesus was having a Lord, the, the last supper with his disciples, he said like this blood is the new covenant in my blood. Like the new covenant started when Jesus was among us and revealed God to us and died on the cross for our sins and rose again. And so there's a sense in which the new covenant or the new testament, when it first started out, was a verbal thing. It wasn't a written down thing. Like the original, the original followers of Jesus went, whoa, there's this new message, the gospel, this news about Jesus. We've got to tell people about Jesus. So they went around verbally telling people about Jesus. It wasn't until years later that they were like, We've, we need to write this down so that when we're dead, it's all written down. But before the New Testament written down happened, the New Testament speaking with your mouth happened. And so that's what Paul and Silas are doing here. They're going around sharing the New Testament message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they show up with this message. This is the new message. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Lord and Savior. And they accepted that into their life because they had already accepted the old covenant into their life. They, they believed that first. And so we can see that what is assumed here is the message of God, whether we're talking about the new one or the old one, the message of God is something that's true and understandable and to be accepted. You following that? Like you, I, I am not, I'm not putting that in there. You can tell. Like that really is what's assumed here. So with that being our three points, that's what I want to talk about today. God's word, the scriptures, true, understandable, and to be accepted. So let's start with true. 
Um, like I said, the passage assumes it's true. Paul assumed it was true. Um, I think Luke assumes it's true, like just as you read it. I don't think there's any place that I can remember. I, there's, I don't think there's any place in the book of Acts where it says, and Paul believed the Bible. Like it doesn't directly say that. Just the whole story is written like that's true, right? He, he quotes from it and he says, this is why you should believe it. And he goes into the synagogues and he reasons from the scriptures as to why the Messiah had to suffer and rise again. It's just assumed that Paul believed it was true. And this verse we've already said, you could tell by the way it's written, the Bereans assumed that it was true too. That's why they checked that when Paul showed up. And you can also tell that Luke assumes that the scriptures are true. The fact that he uses a complimentary word, he's not, it's not like these people, were, these people were so silly, they just believed anything. No, they're more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. He, he's saying these people were good because they welcomed the new message and they examined to make sure it checked the old message. They believed it was true and you can tell Luke is saying they ought to have believed it was true. So, Every character, everybody involved in this paragraph of the Bible, they all assumed that God's word is true, the scriptures are true. So today, I wanted to proclaim to you, the scriptures are true. The scriptures are true. And I wanted to specifically talk to any of you in this room who struggle with that, like struggle believing that. I'm sure in a room this size, there are some of you that go, eh, I don't know about that. I don't think so. So I specifically want to talk just for a few minutes to anybody in this room who struggles specifically with inerrancy. Is the thing, that's kind of the angle I want to talk about it. Those of you who struggle with inerrancy. Now, there may be some of you in this room that you right now say, like, I don't struggle with inerrancy at all because I've literally never heard that word until this moment. Okay, like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what that is, so, but it is not a struggle for me. And for you, I'd say, awesome, great for you. Um, then there may be some of you here who go, no, I know what the word inerrancy means and it's not a struggle for me. I believe it. And then there may be some of you in this room that go, no, I know what that word means, and it is a struggle. I've gone to churches where they say that, and I just, I've come across stuff, and I just, I don't know. And I had a college professor, and he said some stuff, and I'm like, oh. And I had a friend who was agnostic, and he said some stuff, and I'm like, oh. And then I went on a website one time, and I was like, oh. And then someone came along and said, the Bible's right about everything. And I was like, eh, right? And so, I mean, some of you, you know what I'm talking about? And so, thank you. So I want to talk with those of you that struggle with that. I can empathize with you. Like I, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I know exactly how you feel. I've, I've been there before. Um, so I wanted to say this, first of all. I'm aware that those things exist in the Bible. Like the th when people go, what about the apparent, what about the contradictions? What about the fact that there's things in the Bible and they don't match other things that we know to be true? Or the fact that there are parts of the Bible that don't match other parts of the Bible, right? And there's a contradiction there. What about the fact that there's like inaccuracies or imprecisions? Like there's these, these things that you're like, well, we'd never write that in a modern day newspaper. We would call that an error. Like what do you do when you come across that stuff? And so I wanted you to know, first of all, I've come across that stuff. So when I tell you the scriptures are true, I want you to realize you're hearing it not from someone who it's never dawned on them or they've never noticed that it's in there, right? Like I, I have taught the Bible my entire adult life and really hardcore the past 11 years, teaching like verse by verse of the Bible. I've come across tons of those things. Those parts of the Bible, that's, in, that's not right. That's imprecise. That doesn't match with this thing. That contradicts this other passage. I've seen tons of them. I don't call them errors. I don't think that's what, I don't, that's, I don't think that's what we need to call them but I'm aware that they're there. Like the, the, the problem passages, I just want you to know, I know that they're there. I'm aware that in the Gospels, there is a description of Jesus dying on the cross, and one of the Gospel writers seems to say that when Jesus Christ was crucified, the, the whole process started at the third hour of the day. And then there's another Gospel that says that the crucifixion started at the sixth hour of the day. So which one is it? Is Jesus crucified at the third hour or the sixth hour? And then different people have all different opinions about that. And well, what, what, what is it? And there are some people that would say, you know, well, they got it wrong. And there's some people that say, no, there's like a difference between the way Romans counted for time and Jewish people counted for time. And then some people would go like, oh my gosh, this doesn't even matter. Like this was a, this was a culture where no one had a watch and everyone looked at the sun and guessed. Like <laughs> this isn't even an issue. You know, but there's all different concerns about that, right? I'm aware that... <clears throat> um, <laughs> When Je before Jesus died on the cross, the, they tortured him and mocked him, and they put a robe on him. Remember that story where they kind of acted like he was a king, and they put a robe on him and said, King of the Jews? And Matthew's version of that story says that the robe that they put on him, he calls it a scarlet robe. Matthew says they put a scarlet robe on Jesus and then mocked him. And Mark tells that same exact story, and he says it was a purple robe. <gasps> what do we do? There's a contradiction in the two stories, right? Now, I assume it was a reddish-purple robe, okay? 
and there are two men that are telling the story. <laughs> and colors are approximate, aren't they? I mean, I know some of you don't think that. Some of you women are going to go, no, 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 tan is not the same as taupe. Okay, good. You keep thinking that. <laughs> but I'm just telling you, a lot of us think colors are approximate. I mean, there are probably a ton of you in this room. You have right now in your closet a pink shirt that you call your red shirt because that's what color it used to be. <laughs> right? I do. I have one of those. I have a Royal Family Kids Camp shirt that I bet you I'd say to my wife, hand me my red shirt. And it's like, no, oh, this has been pink for quite a while. Right? It's like I've washed it a hundred times. It's faded red. Well, it doesn't matter whether I call it red or pink or faded red, right? At least it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I, my wife wouldn't go, errant, okay? Liar, right? That's not, what, that's not what we do. We understand colors. Are, like, sometimes it takes close enough. I assume it was a reddish purple robe. Um, I am aware that there are scholars who say that in the book of Ecclesiastes, this is in the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes contains Persian words that would have come after the time period of Solomon. So how could Solomon be credited as the author of the book of Ecclesiastes if there's words in it that came from after his time? I am aware, and again, these are, verse, like, uh, these are things I've come across just as I've taught through the Bible. I taught through the book of Ecclesiastes, that's when I learned that. I taught through the book of Galatians, and when I did, I remember in chapter 3 there's a section where Paul is describing the amount of time between the time period of Abraham and of Moses. How much is between Abraham and Moses? And Paul says 400 years are in between Abraham and Moses. And it's true, there are 400 years between Abraham and Moses. But if you go back to the Old Testament, you'll see it's actually, it was more than 400 years. It was probably closer to 500 years. You have the whole Israelite captivity of 400 years plus the lifetimes of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses. It might have been like 500 years. And so you go, well, that number wasn't right, right? It wasn't, it wasn't precise. If the Ocala Star Banner had put that number, you go, no, no, change it to this number that's more correct, right? That's, a, that's an error. And there are many more passages of Scripture that are like that. I've come across many of them. Okay? There are so many of them, and I don't have time this morning to list every single difficult passage and apparent contradiction and you know, problem passage like that, and I don't have time to give you an explanation for every single one, although I, I do have an explanation for all of the examples I used this morning. But what I'd rather do than just try to go through each and every individual one is just give you a general principle, and this is the thing I want you to understand. Human communication is often imprecise. This is something that you actually already know, but I want to remind you of it. Human communication is often imprecise, and God chose to communicate to us through human communication so that we could understand him. God, uh, God uh, raised up prophets in the Old Testament who were humans, who spoke in like whatever language they spoke, a human language to the people, and said, this is what God wants you to know. So we have whatever God wanted them to say, but then it's, it's, it's said to the people by a human in human language. And we have New Testament apostles who wrote down books for us in our New Testament, and they wrote them down in a human language with human communication. And Jesus came here, God in a body among us, God among us as a human, and he spoke with, in human language, with human communication, and all of the like imprecisions and stuff that come along with human communication. Jesus used figures of speech, that were open to interpretation and sometimes difficult to understand, like how humans talk. And so I just wanted you to know, human communication is often imprecise, and God has been gracious enough to communicate to us in our language, in our way, with human communication. Let me give you an example of what I mean by human communication is often imprecise. Let me give a real simple, easy one to start with. The word sunrise. Probably most everybody in this room has used the word sunrise. It's not accurate. The sun doesn't rise. The earth rotates. But, but when someone says sunrise, no one goes liar. No one says you, are, you, you struggle of, with errancy, right? We just understand sunrise is a word we use that describes what we're seeing, right? It's, it's, it's not accurate, but, it, but it's accurate enough. We know what we're talking about, the sunrise. That's, just, that's a word that we use. Now, maybe some culture hundreds of years from now might look back and go, that's so weird. We call them earth rotations. It's so weird that they, would, they thought the sun like rose. But we don't think that's weird. Let me give you another one. This one, I think, I hope this one's helpful. I, I was thinking about this for about two weeks now, and I, just, I think it's fantastic, but we'll see. This is an example, I think, of imprecision. This is a technical inaccuracy in our own culture. Everybody in this room does this all the time. You tolerate it all around you. In fact, you don't just tolerate it. We all participate in this. Imagine someone is 32 years old, okay? A guy is 32 years old, and his birthday is this upcoming Tuesday, okay? So he's about to turn 33, right? His 33rd birthday is on Tuesday. If you were to go up to that guy today and say, how old are you? What is he like, in our culture, what is he likely to say? 32, 
right? It's very common for someone to say, I'm 32, right? My birthday's, I'm going to turn 33 in a couple of days. I'm 32. That's how most of us do it. Now, here's what's weird about that. First of all, that guy's not 32. Like, if he was being more precise, that guy is 32 years, 363 days, and a certain number of hours and minutes and seconds old, right? That would be, like, more true. That would be more precisely true. Now, now I'm not saying that's weird, because that's not weird. Of course, we don't say that when we say our age. We don't say our age all the way down to the second, because the human brain cannot calculate our ages all the way up to the minute or all the way up to the second. So, of course, we don't do that. Of course, we round. This is what's weird, though, in our culture. We always round down, no matter how close the next one is. You could be 32 and 363 days old, and when someone says, how old are you? Isn't it weird? You, we will round down 363 units of measurement before we will round up two. And in fact, in our culture, this is so weird. So when you just think about what's in reality, when you think about rounding, someone who is 32 and 363 days old, the number 33 is, the, is closer to true, right? If you're going to round, the more accurate number is 33. That's closer to true than 32 is. And yet in our culture, we consider 32 to be the truth. And 33 is a lie, right? You know, you haven't turned 33 yet. We especially do that if you're like 17. No, you have not turned 18 yet. Or if you're 20, no, you're not 21, right? So you've got two options here if you're going to round. You've got two numbers, and we take the number that is more true and call it a lie, and the number that is less true, and we call that the truth. Isn't that weird? And yet, here's the thing. In this room, nobody in this room thought that was weird until just now. <laughs> because we've all just been living in it. That's the way we talk. Human communication is often like that. But you could imagine a person 1,000 years from now could look back at our culture and watch our videos and read our documents and go, wow, those people were weird. They, they got their ages wrong like half the time. <laughs> Wouldn't that happen? Yeah. But here's the thing. If you were one of those people 1,000 years from now and you were to take a time machine and come back to our time and you were to talk to somebody and say, how old are you? And they go, 32, I'm going to turn 33 in a couple of days. You probably would not go, mm-mm. Errant. That's not, in my culture, that's not what we call that. You are errant. That is practically a lie. And in fact, because you're wrong about that, I can't trust anything else you say. Like, I doubt all of your other sentences. And in fact, I reject you. Quite frankly, I don't know if you exist. <laughs> you wouldn't do that, would you? No, because that would be an overreaction to the imprecision of the language. And what I'm trying to say is, if that's true, don't do that to God. Don't look at his word and say, oh, I found a part that by, in, in my culture and by my view of looking at it, that, that is inaccurate. Mm -mm. It says purple and it says scarlet, you know, or whatever it may be. No, that is not accurate. So I call you errant. And, not just that, and because you're errant in that spot, I'm, I now am going to doubt all of your sentences. And in fact, I reject you. I don't even know if you exist, God. That would be an overreaction to the difficult portions of the Bible. We don't do that to other people. And we shouldn't do it to God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. And He will make your path straight. I hope that was good for someone. I, there have been times I can think of a time in my life where I needed to hear this sermon. And I, I, I hope there will be some of you that leave today and that this sermon will be a gift to you, that you will walk away going, that, that is what I needed to hear today. Uh, number two, so true, understandable, and to be accepted. So we just talked about true, now let's talk about understandable. The Bereans examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They assumed that they could read the Old Testament, understand it, and see if it matched the new message that was coming along. You also can read the scriptures and understand them. Now you might be someone here who goes, mm, not me, you don't know me. Uh, I can't do it. I don't understand scripture. Um, when you get up there, Mario, you, you're smart. You, you must have done education or something. I don't know what you did, but you, got, you get it, and that's great. Um, and, and I'm going to keep coming to church because when you say it, it makes sense. But when I'm at home, this is going to stay closed because I, I can't do it on my own. I've tried to do it without you in the room. It doesn't work. And so what I want to tell you, first of all, that's, just, that's not true, and I'm going to prove to you that that's not true. Um, you can understand the scriptures. You can do it on your own. Um, so I want to give you two suggestions. One of, uh, three, I don't know. We'll see. 
<laughs> Human communication is imprecise. It's however many suggestions I have here. Um, one of the things I want to tell you is to um, go on our church website. If you, have, if you weren't here about a year ago when we did our series, How to Read the Bible, we preached a series about a year ago called How to Read the Bible. And um, there were, if you don't have time to listen to the whole thing, you, don't, you can just listen to part two. That, I think, is the most important one. It's on our website. The whole series is on our website right now, and it's on our YouTube channel. So you can go back one year and listen to that sermon if you want. But How to Read the Bible, sermon number two, was one where I gave you a whole bunch of tips and strategies on how to actually read and understand the words that are on the page. And I, would just, I really want to recommend to you going back and listening to How to Read the Bible Part 2 if you're one of those people that goes, I don't think I know how to read it. And I'm going to tell you one of the things I said in that sermon. I'm going to repeat it, um, and hopefully if it, it'll tempt you to want to go back and listen to the whole sermon. This was one of the tips I gave you. When you're reading the Bible, treat it like a normal book. Like Read it like the way you read any other book. When you go to the library and you check out a John Grisham book, this is what you don't, I don't think anyone in this room does this, you do not check out a John Grisham book and then take it home and open it to the middle and read four sentences and close it and walk away. And then a couple of days later, pick up that book to, and open it to a completely different chapter and read four sentences and close it and walk away. And do that for about a month and then go, John Grisham is like so hard to understand. <laughs> no, you're reading it wrong. And here's the thing, you would know that you were reading it wrong. You wouldn't complain about him. You'd realize like, why am I doing that? That's silly. But here's the thing, like Christians do that with the Bible all the time. Just, I'll, just, I'll just open up a page and read some sentences. Why? You don't do that with anything else. You don't do that with cereal boxes. You start at the top. Goodness, why would we do that with the Bible? So when you read the Bible, just read it like a normal book in order. It has 66 separate sections, 66 separate documents that are in it. So you don't even have to start at the beginning. You can start at the beginning of any of those documents. But start at the beginning. If you're reading Matthew, start at Matthew chapter 1. After Matthew chapter 1, read Matthew chapter 2. 3 comes after 2, 4 comes after 3. Read it in that order till you're done. That's what you do with everything else. That's, how, that's the best way to understand the book of Matthew. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you to do in understanding, and this is the one I hope will prove that you can do this without me. This is an idea that I heard, and I, I did not say this back in that sermon series. So this is new. I'm, I don't think I've ever said this here before. Um, but this is a brilliant idea. I did not make it up. I heard someone else say this. But I think it's great. If you're one of those people that says, when I'm reading my Bible all by myself, I can't understand it, I can't do it, I'll just listen to the pros and, and leave it to them to be able to figure out what it means. This is what I think you should do. Pick a section of the Bible and read it. I'm, I'm going to suggest the book of Mark, okay? Of all the books in the Bible, um, I think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the most important. Those are the four Gospels. They are the four biographies of Jesus. I think Jesus is the most char important character in the Bible, and so I think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the most, four most important books in the Bible, the four books about Jesus. They're, all, they're very similar in that they all tell the story of Jesus. I'm, so you can pick any one of the four of them, but I'm suggesting Mark because it's the shortest one. Okay, so you'll, you'll read through it very quickly and feel so good about yourself, okay? So you read the shortest one, Mark, and as you're reading it, this is what I'm going to suggest you do. You read the book of Mark, and when you come across a word you don't understand, take a pencil and underline that word and keep reading. And when you come across a phrase that you don't understand, underline that phrase, keep reading. And when you come across a sentence you don't understand, underline the whole sentence and keep reading until you get to the end of the book of Mark. Okay, even in like a large print Bible, it's going to be like 12, 13 pages probably, and then you'll be done. You'll have read the book of Mark. And this is what I think is going to happen. At some point, you will be able to, then, I'm pretty sure this will happen with everybody in this room if you do it. You will look back at what you just read the last few days, however long it took you to get through it. You will look back and you will notice that you did not underline everything, right? Once you get to the end of Mark, you will look back and you will go, yeah, I did When I, I say... I can't understand scripture without the pastor around. Like you say that as if you could not possibly understand a sentence without him. But if you actually do this experiment, you will see there are sentences I didn't underline. I did understand some of this. Even if you had a really rough time going through the book of Mark and you underlined half of it, you'll still be able to testify, I understood half of it without help. I understood the other half of it the first time I read it. Then this is what you do. Pick another book then. Okay, pick the book of Romans. That's a good one. It explains the gospel. You can read through the book of Romans. Do the same thing. Underline the parts you don't understand. 
after Romans, let's go to the Old Testament. That's good to read something in the Old Testament. Let's go with Genesis, because that's very foundational. God creates the world in that one. It's fantastic. Let's read Genesis, underline the parts you don't understand. Then one day, go back to the book of Mark and read it a second time. You've gone, to the, you've gone to church more often at this point. You've talked with other believers more often. You've read all of Mark once already. You've read other books. Now you go back to Mark, read Mark a second time. And this is what you're going to notice. When you get to it the second time, you're going to start reading and you're going to come across one of those underlines and you're going to go, yep, I still don't know what that means. And then you're going to come across some of them and you're going to go, well, that's funny. I underlined that last year when I read this, but I know what that means now. You're going to go, honey, where's the erasers? we got an eraser? Because I, 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 I don't want to mark that down as one of the ones I don't understand. I want to erase that, that pencil there. I know what that one means now. And because I've read all of Mark and because I've read other passages of the Bible, I now would say that some of these things that I didn't understand the first time, I got it now. And you can understand the Bible on your own more and more and more if you put the effort into it. Okay, point number three. So the Bible is true, is understandable, and is to be accepted. To be accepted. Believing that the Bible is true and believing that it is understandable is not enough. You must welcome God's message into your life in such a way that it changes your life. There are texts, there are words or messages that we read that we understand and we even think they're true but they don't change our life. We don't receive them in such a way that it changes who we are. You must welcome God's message into your life so that it changes you. Let me give you an example of a common text that probably most everyone in this room has seen that we would say, yes, yeah, it's true and understandable, but, I, but, I don't, but, but there are a lot of people that don't do anything about it. So it's the warning label that's on a package of cigarettes. Have you ever seen it? Okay. Oh, this is church people. No, we've never seen this. <laughs> Fine, but anyway, if you, ever, if you ever smoked a package of cigarettes or if you've ever loved a smoker or if you ever worked at Publix or a gas station and you sold them, you saw that on the cigarette package there's a warning, right? The Surgeon General's warning and there's different ones on different packages and sometimes they talk about pregnancy and low birth weight and sometimes they talk about emphysema and lung cancer, but you know what I'm talking about, right? They all pretty much say this is bad for you or keep smoking these and you'll die. Like that's the gist of what it says on the package. And I would guess in this country there are hundreds of thousands of people who, would, who, who see that and they would read it and they would go, I understand it. And they would even say, I think it's true. And then they still pull out a cigarette and they smoke it. It hasn't changed their life. And what I'm saying to you is, don't do that with God's texts, right? Like if God warns you about something, don't treat it like that. Like God, what God says matters way more than the Surgeon General, Right? Like way more, like way more, like I'm not tall enough, way more. We can't just acknowledge that it's true and understandable. Um, there's a seminary professor, he's retired now, um, a retired seminary professor named John Frame. I actually took two of his classes in seminary, and this month I came across this quote of his. I don't remember him saying it in class, but I really like it. He said this, Everything in Scripture has the force of law. What it teaches we are to believe. What it commands, we are to do. We should take its wisdom to heart, imitate its heroes, laugh at its jokes, trust its promises, and sing its songs. I thought that was such a great quote that he's saying all of Scripture is authoritative. It's supposed to change us not just the commands. There are commands in Scripture, and sure, we're supposed to do the commands. It says, thou shalt not murder. All right, let's not, let's not murder. But there's a, a lot of the Bible is not commands, right? Most of the Bible is not commands. So what do you do with all the rest of it? It's still authoritative, right? What do you do with the sections of the Bible that are uh, like Paul visiting Berea, and the people examined the Scriptures, and then he got chased out of town? There's no commands there. What do you do with that? You, you take it to be true and you understand it and then you, you receive it. You live differently because of it. If the Bible doesn't give a command, but if the Bible talks about something like it's a good thing, then you celebrate that thing. And if the Bible talks about something like it's a grievous thing, then you, you feel sorrow when you witness that thing. And so you, you, we are to welcome God's message into our lives and let it change us like the Bereans did. Let's pray.
God, I pray that the things that are merely of me would be quickly forgotten, but that which is of you would be remembered for a long time. If there's anything I said that I got wrong today, I pray it wouldn't be remembered very well. God, I pray that you would be the one who speaks to us today. I know for sure I can think of times in my life where it would have been so good if I could have heard this. And so I just ask that this would be, I pray that you would use this in a good way for, for some people in this room, that they would walk out of here and go, that's what I needed to hear, and God was gracious to allow that to happen. So I ask for that, God, and, and we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that would, you would communicate to us in ways that are true and understandable and that you expect us to treat you like you're a God who said it and not our like assistant, that we have to take it as authoritative. And I thank you that you, you communicated to us in human ways where we can understand it. And I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. I thank you that my whole eternity is not, does not rest and fall on how hard I can believe or how good I get at understanding the scripture or how hard I try at obeying. But that's your, it's your spirit that comes into my life and makes me acceptable to you, makes me want to know you, makes me want to read, makes me, like, gives me, so, I, so I, can, I can trust in you and I can follow you. You enable me to do that and I thank you for that. I thank you that I can hang on to you for that. But I pray that I would do my part and I pray that for everybody in this room. I pray you'd help us to treat your word the way you want us to treat it. We love you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you in advance for whatever you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me end with these good words from God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 says, And you know that from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That is good news. Thank you.